And now I have to speak in English because I have to welcome two very important colleagues, two very important researchers, Dr. Cue from Switzerland and Dr. Pereira from Portugal, who are experts in sepsis. They are physicians of intensive care units and they have also, like the University of Crete, checked already this biomarker, namely pancreatic stone protein, who is a very good predictive uh, uh, biomarker of sepsis. And I'm ready to invite first Dr. Cue, who is a professor of intensive care medicine from the University of Bern in Switzerland, who is a researcher, expert in sepsis and biomarkers. Dr. Cue, we are ready to listen to your talk. And I would also ask the, the speakers to stick with the time. You have 25 minutes to share with us your experience. We are ready. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for the nice introduction. So I'm a senior physician at the intensive care unit in Bern. And so I'm also the head of the research laboratory of the Department of Intensive Care Medicine. So I will give you an overview on the background and also on the results that we and other colleagues have uh, collected on the pancreatic stone protein. But first, what is the challenge? So you may, uh, most of you are familiar with sepsis and with the new definition the sepsis 3 definition that called that sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infections. And this is this organ dysfunction can affect most organ system, can affect the brain. We have the septic encephalopathy that we uh, sometimes see in our patient, that affect the respiratory system, that affect the cardiovascular system, going to a hypertension and going to shock. It affects the liver, the renal, makes renal failure, and also affect the platelets and the coagulation system. So it has an effect on all the, the whole body. It's, it, it's a quite very important problem, public health problem. Here are recent, recent data on the epidemiology of uh, sepsis. And you see that the number of emergency admission to the UK hospital within a six year period is quite high. And sepsis mainly affect uh, very, so very young children and uh, elderly people. So, and also uh, and, and another very important aspect of the epidemiology of sepsis is its incidence is rising and it's rising worldwide. Here's an example, it's rising uh, here in the in North America, the incidence is also rising in Europe, but in the same time, the mortality is decreasing. It's decreasing because there have been some initiative to uh, to tackle down the sepsis to and to have, make a uh, bundle answer to the sepsis, and this has as result this has resulted in a reduction of the mortality. So we all know that like, the, the early diagnostic of sepsis is very important. And any delay in the administration of antibiotic will result in an increase of mortality. There have been recent data published in uh, 2017, so four years ago, that clearly demonstrate that the risk of dying increased by each hour of delay in the, in the diagnostic and in the anti antibiotic administration. It's not always that uh, severe uh, you, you, you have here. So it depends on the severity of the infection. If you have hemodynamic instability, you have to act very early. But if you have a stable patient, uh, so for instance, a patient with a ventilator associated pneumonia, you have maybe more time for the diagnostic. And if you are in the ambulatory care, you have much more time. So time, Time to antibiotic depends on the severity of infection, but what we know from all the data on the epidemiology of sepsis that you have to uh, 
to uh, administer the treatment very early. And this is a particularly true if you want to avoid uh, the mortality and especially in the, the, the most of the people that are dying of sepsis are elderly people that we have with com comorbidity, they're frail. And so it's very important in this patient population to act very early. So what is the issue? And so what we are facing is that it's not that easy to diagnose sepsis. We know that we have to act first, but we have to select the right patient. If not, we cannot give to everyone antibiotic. And here's a very interesting study um, that uh, assessed and looked at the likelihood of infection in patients that come to the ICU with a presumed uh, sepsis diagnostic. And you see that here in the, uh, on the left side, so you have only 30% that have a definite diagnosis of sepsis, and then you have most of the patients are in the so-called gray zone. So for this patient, you don't know, there might be a sepsis, but might be alternative diagnostic, and for this gray zone, we might, we must have a solution. We must have something that can help us differentiate patients that are in the gray zone, if they are, whether they have sepsis or not. And this is particularly true for patients here on the right side, for patients that have lung infections. So most of the patients that have lung infection coming to the ICU might have alternate diagnostic. And so we have to have something to sort this patient, those patients out. So what might be the solutions? So we can use biomarkers. So biomarker is an indicator of, can be an indicator for normal biological processes, can also point out to pathogenic processes or be a marker of pharmacologic response to a therapeutic intervention. What we ask to a biomarker is that it defines what is normal and detects what is abnormal. So you have different use of the biomarker. You can have biomarker to screen patients or so to identify patients that are, for instance, at increased risk of adverse outcome. You can use biomarker to diagnose, to establish the diagnostic, and this is something that would be very interesting for sepsis. You can also use biomarker to make a risk stratification, to identify those patients that would have a, a bad outcome. And then you can use them to monitor the response of treatment. So in the case of sepsis, so the biomarker are mainly used to diagnose, to make a risk stratification of the patient and to monitor response to treatment. So most of the, the most common bio use, commonly used biomarker are CRP and PCT. But now, what I will show you is that there might be some evidence that pancreatic stone protein, a biomarker that has now been studied for 20 years, might be a promising biomarker of sepsis. So the, this, uh, the next two slides will give you some of the background. So pancreatic stone protein, or also called PSP or PSP-REG in the literature, was discovered in association with acute or chronic pancreatic inflammation. We know that PSP is mostly circulated by pancreatic acinar cells here, a human autopsy study, and you see that PSP is mostly detected in the pancreas and the adjacent, uh, adjacent tissue, and it's not detected in, in others. So the, more, the, the main production is the pancreas. And then you have the result in the serum. So it was thought that initially that PSP could be a marker for pancreatic injury and recurrent pancreatitis. But uh, early work from, uh, from Zurich group, where this PSP has been mostly studied, showed that the pancreas sends remote organ damage and systematic stress. And the pancreas, when confronted to organ damage and systematic stress, will respond by secreting PSP. And reading made a very nice uh, uh, confirmation study using a cecum ligation puncture uh, model in mice. So you have the, the baseline here in white of the PSP, in the pancreas, and then you can it react a little bit to the, the shame operation, but it reacts mostly uh, when it's uh, when the the mice become septic. And this response in the pancreas is also reflected in the serum. 
Here you see you have uh, the baseline in the serum of the mice, then the mice that are operated but not infected, it's quite the same, and then it rises in response to sepsis, to the infection due to a C communication. So this is, this is the result that is the, the baseline to, that might suggest that pancreatic stone protein might be a good, a promising biomarker of sepsis. So if you, you want to study and confirm this hypothesis that uh, then uh, PSP is a biomarker of sepsis, you have to, to have study to, uh, to assess its accuracy in diagnostic, in prognostic, and maybe also in therapeutic in the monitoring of the response to infection. But now let's go through the evidence that PSP can help in the diagnostic of sepsis and differentiate between infectious and non-infectious states. So this is the, the first green cap study performed at the, the group in Zurich, where they compare in patients with admitted for trauma, the evolution of uh, CRP and PSP. So you know that CRP is highly affected by any inflammation, should this inflammation be sept of sepsis origin or not. And you see that it's very high starting the first day. In contrast here on the, the right panel, you see the evolution of PSP over the two weeks of hospitalization in the ICU. And then you have to difference in the patient that have no infection during the stay, that have only localized infection or that have gone underground sepsis, sepsis complication. And you see that you have patient, after trauma, you have a slightly rise here in, in white of the concentration of uh, PSP, but this rise is markedly greater and bigger when patients have infection or have sepsis. So this is the first insight that PSP might be a good biomarker of sepsis. What is also interesting is that PSP in contrast to PCT or CRP is not infected, affected by non-infectious uh, inflammatory state. And this you can, this is a, a recent study from burn patient. You know that burn, the burn trauma is inducing a tremendous inflammation, but it's not of septic origin, particularly in the first two days after trauma. And here you see that in contrast to CRP, which is highly affected by the burn trauma, and also PCT, PSP is mainly remain mainly unaffected by non-infectious non or non-septic inflammatory state. So that's might very interesting because we can differentiate in inflammatory state between sepsis and non-sepsis. This is also in um, yeah, a, a very important study that assessed the accuracy of PSP detecting infections, severe sepsis or septic shock in patients uh, that um, uh, should have been uh, admitted to the ICU. And you see that the level the PSP level measured in serum of those patients is higher when these patients have severe sepsis in contrast when they have no infection or non-infective uh, serous. And, and additional information from this study is that PSP is also a marker of organ dysfunction and it rises with the SOFA score, in parallel with the SOFA score. The more organ dysfunction you have, the, more, the higher is the PSP blood level. So we, uh, we recently published a meta-analysis when we uh, were able to get individual patient data from the five important studies that assess the ability of PSP for, for the diagnostic of infection. When we, uh, we, we had data from, from multi uh, country across Europe and from multiple clinical condition patient from Go, for going from the emergency room or patient admitted to the ICU. In, in, in total, we, uh, we could analyze more than 600 patients. So what was the goal of our meta-analysis? It was to determine the performance of PSP in detecting infections and to, pour, to propose a threshold value for that purpose. And then it was also the goal to validate it across heterogeneous population from emergency room to the ICU. So all patients that are going to the hospital with a suspicion of sepsis. What we were able to show that we were able to calculate using a 
the union index methods calculate the cutoff of PSP. So, so it was around uh, 45 with the, the, the previous methods of ELISA uh, assay to measure safety. And with this, we, we could have a very good accuracy, a relatively good accuracy of uh, 0 0.81 which is much better than the, the one that's here, P and PCT. Then we'd see, uh, can we increase the accuracy of a PSP in detecting infectious state if we combine several biomarkers? And we make uh, several um, um, uh, models where we combine PSP with CRP, PSP with PCT and all together. And uh, we achieve the maximal uh, accuracy or maximum efficacy efficiency when with the AUC of uh, 0 0.9 when we combine PSP and CRP. And adding PCT to the one did not increase the accuracy the, 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 the model. So now that we, we, we saw that PSP might differentiate between infectious and non-infectious sets, we can move to the second uh, assessment. So is uh, PSP of prognostic value. And can PSP stratify and predict the outcome? We already know from, the, from one study that PSP is correlating with organ dysfunction, but is this correlating with uh, risks and particularly risk of death? So this is the first study that was uh, performed in, so, uh, 10 years ago by a uh, 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 team a group of, uh, in, in Basel where they study a patient with ventilator associated pneumonia and they defined cutoff that predict either survival or death. So we, here from this study, we, can, we have an insight that the level of PSP might correlate with the risk of death in the patient with uh, VAP on the ICU. Another patient population where the, uh, the group of uh, Rolf Graf is Zurich, uh, assess, uh, so, uh, investigate whether the PSP would uh, correlate with the prediction of either organ failure, multiple organ failure or death. And you can see that PSP is the, the bold line on the, the three graphs, is much better in predicting either organ failure, MOF or death. It's much better than the other markers such as CRP, IL-6 or PCT that were investigated in patients with peritonitis. So we did a, a, a similar study, but in patients requiring ICU management. So a mix of patients with heterogeneous uh, um, um, in fact focus. And we, we could also, uh, we could also uh, point out that uh, PSP was a good predictive predictor of, of uh, a, a hospital mortality with a very good pro uh, prediction in septic patient and in patient with septic shock. It was as good as IL-6, but you know, the IL-6, the time window is, might be challenging and it was much better than PCT that has no effect in these models. So we perform a, a, a further analysis where we try to combine PSP and PCT uh, biomarker, not with uh, other biomarkers, but with severity score that you, you know we are calculating at uh, ICU admission. And you can see that if you combine with APG2 and SAPS2, you can have a, a very good correlation between the level of PSP and the probability of death. So what are the, the first take home message? So PSP is not affected by non-infectious inflammatory processes. This uh, is, uh, is well known in trauma and particularly in burn trauma. PSP indicates the presence of infections in various patient population, in ICU patients, in emergency room patients. It, it indicates also the likelihood that infected patients will develop organ dysfunction and might also identify patients at high risk of death. Now, what is now in the real life? So you know now, thanks to a new technology, nano 3 d technology, PSP can be measured uh, uh, via point of care. And then you can have the result within minutes. It's like a, a blood gas analysis. So you can have this very, very rapidly. And the, the questions, how could it be useful 
So that's why we uh, have been across Europe a multi-centric prospective clinical study that assessed the, um, the uh, potential of a PSP for the early diagnostic of sepsis. So the primary objective of this study was to assess the performance of serial measurement of PSP in the early detection of sepsis. And the design was an open label study where septi sep the definition of sepsis and the diagnostic of sepsis was done by the investigator, by a first and the second endpoint adjudic adjudication committee. So this is the um, uh, graphic uh, schematic representation of the study design of this uh, ABPSP study. Patients were admitted in the ICU. They were uh, admitted, so included in the study if they were at risk of um, developing sepsis uh, during their stay. And then PSP was measured twice a day during the whole stay. And then we uh, the, they looked back uh, when the patient develops sepsis, they look back at the at the PSP level. So here, so the education com uh, committee in patients with sepsis, there was about two hundred and fifty patients were included. About were included in final analysis, and fifty patients developed a septic event. The adjudication committee declared the time of the sepsis, and then we look back at the level of the PSP. And what you can see is that the PSP is rising 72 hours before the diagnostic of sepsis. So this is also a very important aspect that in the real life with a point of care, you can have a measure, measure a rapid measurement of, um, of a biomarker that might rise some days before septic is diagnosed by the clinician. And if you, so the PSP compare as well as the other biomarker in this aspect. And if you are, if you combine PSP and CRP, you achieve the best accuracy, best sensitivity and specificity in the real, in this real life study. So what is the, the second take home message? So PSP is now available as a point of care thanks to the innovative nano 3D technology and can be used to diagnose sepsis early, to stratify patients according to the severity and evaluate the risk of mortality. And this performance has been confirmed by a recent prospective study. So now, can, what is the, the outlook? So we, we have data on the diagnostic of, uh, of the diagnostic value of PSP, diagnostic uh, uh, infectious and, uh, and differentiating infectious and non-infectious sepsis. We have some data in the prognostication of uh, PSP, but now what we are missing is some data in the therapeutic and monitoring. So can we base, uh, base the initial prescription on the antibiotic on a, CRP, on a PSP uh, level? Can we use PSP as PCT to investigate the response to intervention or the response to medication, this is an open field for research. So now I'm at the end of uh, my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Que, for describing us your experience with the pancreatic stone protein and its predictive value for sepsis, especially the, in the intensive care unit and the comparison to other biomarkers. It was a very interesting lecture. Are there any questions for Dr. Que? Υπάρχουν ερωτήσεις για τον ομιλητή. Έχουμε μερικά λεπτά που θα μπορούσαμε να τα χρησιμοποιήσουμε για συζήτηση. Προφανώς δεν υπάρχουν. We have no questions, Dr. Que. We have to thank you again for your lecture. It was very interesting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And now we proceed to our next uh, speaker, who is Dr. Pereira from Portugal. He is head of the intensive care unit of the Hospital de Vila Franca in Portugal.
He is also an expert in intensive care unit, and uh, he has to tell us a lot about his uh, pilotic uh, use of uh, pancreatic stone protein as uh, an important biomarker for severe sepsis. Dr. Pereira, we are happy to have you with us. We are ready to listen to your talk about your experience with pancreatic stone protein. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is João Gonçalves Pereira, I'm, I'm from Portugal, and uh, my interest is, uh, is in sepsis, and uh, we are using the pancreatic stone protein about uh, one year now, from now, and uh, what I will uh, show you in the next slides is our experience in, with uh, the more or less 50 uh, first patients that we use this uh, new biomarker, uh, at least for us is new, and uh, uh, the results that we have. So I will share my slides. Okay. So now, um, so uh, one of the important things that, uh, that we uh, that we understand is uh, when we approach these kind of patients, what kind of what do we really see? We we have an injury to the patient and all kinds of injury, the inflammatory injury, and then uh, during the, the next uh, days to uh, weeks, we have this kind of organ dysfunctions, depending on the, the severity of the injury, and then later on, we have recovery. Of course, when we look at a patient with a, an infection, we have uh, some, uh, some differences be uh, between patients with infection and without infection. So, when the patient arrives to the, uh, to the emergency department, we believe that the patient deserves a good uh, microbiological workup and then we start an antibiotic and uh, after that uh, if uh, everything is going fine we do, uh, you note uh, improvement in the, in the patient's uh, state and then your patient will be discharged. So, but there are difficulties in this kind of approach. It's, it seems very easy at, when you look at it but there are uh, difficulties that we uh, may, uh, may experience. Of course, one of the big things that we all always look is the mixed cases. Uh, patients that we, uh, we identify the infection very late and the patients that we really don't uh, understand that they are infected. And these missed cases have uh, an important re increased risk of death. And Professor Que also uh, noted that uh, uh, patients who have septi uh, sepsis and especially uh, uh, septic shock that are not treated with appropriate antibiotics have an increased risk of death. But there are also another problem, uh, maybe less, uh, uh, less um, noted that the patient may be overdiagnosed and these patients have an increased risk of death also due to delayed therapy of the right di diagnosis. If you start an antibiotic and you believe patients have an infection, you may miss an important uh, inflammatory or um, or different uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, in, even different infectious diagnosis that uh, you may uh, not know because you uh, already decided that the patient has an infection that you believe in that infection. And also the, import the importance of antibiotic resistance. But uh, I've also pointed to you that uh, this antibiotic that you are giving to the patient without the needs of the patient really uh, may have an increased toxicity and uh, uh, interfere with, uh, and uh, there are several work uh, studies pointing to that, uh, interfere with uh, uh, the mitochondrial re regeneration that happens in the patients with uh, uh, the shock, and uh, this may uh, be having importance in the patient's prognosis. So, of course, we want to identify these true cases of sepsis to treat them, but uh, to uh, avoid giving antibiotics to patients who don't need them and uh, avoid, uh, obviously, dismissed cases. Uh, because as uh, 
this is not an easy task, as uh, Professor Kuehl also uh, pointed uh, to, this, um, to this study. Even in patients coming from the emergency department, patients with uh, community-acquired sepsis, you may think it uh, uh, easier to identify, but um, uh, even in, this, uh, in those patients, uh, the infection and sepsis may not be as easy to identify as you might think, and uh, you may overlook uh, to those patients, and you may think that all those patients have uh, sepsis, but uh, as you can see uh, in this study, almost um, uh, a little bit more than 40% uh, uh, really di didn't have sepsis and were treated with anti antibiotics, and that may uh, cause some harm to the, those patients, and you uh, have to think about that. So, uh, you can use biomarkers to support and improve the clinical interventions accuracy that you are doing, and uh, you may use it as a diagnostic, monitoring, prognostic. Uh, Professor Kwe all, uh, uh, already um, reviewed the, uh, the importance of uh, pancreatic stone protein into to all these points, and I won't, uh, won't uh, lose uh, time uh, to that. So, one of the important uh, things that we have in this uh, uh, PSP and the use of this PSP is the, the, the fact that it's a, a point of care technology and this short turnaround time. Sometimes I, I'm doing rounds with uh, uh, my residents and we suspect of an infection that was not uh, diagnosed previously in, the, in a patient. And in about 15 minutes, we have the results of this uh, PSP. And it's uh, very easy to use it to decide uh, how to, uh, to uh, start or not, or not to start an antibiotic. And, uh, but not only that, but also to decide to perform cultures. And sometimes it's easy, like uh, uh, bloodletting and to perform uh, uh, blood cultures. But sometimes it's more difficult if you have have to, uh, to uh, study the LCR uh, fluid, for instance. It's uh, uh, maybe not uh, that uh, easy, and uh, you have to decide those, those um, tests according to this uh, uh, pancreatic stone protein. It's very easy. And uh, let me show some of our results. Uh, for instance, uh, this um, in, in patients that we perform but blood cultures and were positive, uh, you can see the difference between uh, the patients who have a high PSP and those who have a, a low PSP. Of course, the, you can note that there is some overlap even patients uh, with uh, very uh, low levels of PSP. Some of them have positive blood cultures. This is not a perfect tool. Uh, there are no perfect tools, but it improves very much your accuracy of the sepsis diagnosis, as you can see. If in patients with uh, this PSP level, high, uh, in a higher PSP level, there are much more uh, the probability of having a true infection is much higher than in patients with low levels of, uh, of PSP. So you, if you use your uh, uh, diagnostic accuracy, if you uh, use your uh, clinical judgment, and then apply this kind of tests, you have a very much, uh, very high improvement of uh, the probability of having or not having an infection. So we can use it to rule out the need for an antibiotics. Let's, let me show this uh, patient, uh, 15 years patient, uh, and we, we uh, have the, and we are always leading with these kind of patients because in this in this, uh, uh, in this patient he has a COVID infection and. Uh, uh, um, and it was admitted five years, uh, uh, five days early with fever, cough, and this, uh, this, uh, the chest X-ray. And uh, uh, we used the, the, the PSP and uh, note that this patient has a low value of PSP, although he has fever and although he has um, he has a uh, um, uh, worsening oxygenation, but uh, according to our uh, to our data, we, uh, as the PSP was low, we didn't uh, need to start an antibiotic, and the patient improved there, uh, thereafter without an antibiotic. So, in the, uh, about one third of the, our cases, the, uh, the, this, uh, the PSP was used to support the decision to not start an antibacterial drug, although there was clinical suspicion of infections. Uh, but 
as uh, Professor Que also uh, showed this study, uh, the inflammatory uh, uh, the PSP was able to detect to discriminate between inflammatory uh, insult to the patient without infection and uh, the inflammatory uh, uh, insult to the patient with infection. So we only start uh, antibiotics in patients with infections and uh, try to uh, to rule out antibiotics in patients without infections. And the PSP was able able to help us uh, in this uh, in, to, to this um, objective because uh, I also want to, to show you this uh, this uh, analysis this study and uh, what uh, the authors addressed was uh, the patients infected with COVID and uh, in a very large uh, number of patients and uh, you can see uh, uh, more than 3,000 patients and uh, what they found is only 3.5% uh, of patients really have a bacterial co-infection when they were admitted to, uh, to the hospital. But the prescription of antibiotics was 70%. So according to this data, we started to do uh, to use the PSP in patients admitted to the to our ICU uh, with COVID and uh, um, and the suspicion, uh, suspicion of a, a, co a bacterial co-infection and were able to uh, withdraw antibiotics antibiotics or we hold antibiotics uh, both uh, in patients admitted even in patients who need uh, invasive uh, mechanical ventilation and we really didn't have uh, positive cultures uh, in patients we, uh, uh, that we uh, we draw uh, uh, or withhold antibiotics in this in this context uh, of course, we would not use only to avoid giving antibiotics. Sometimes we want uh, to give antibiotics and we uh, have a suspicion of uh, sepsis. And uh, this uh, PSP marker also uh, help us to increase the certainty of our diagnosis. This happened in about 20% uh, of patients. Uh, when the, the threshold that we use is this uh, 215, according to our uh, to our experience. And uh, uh, but uh, we really saw that uh, in, in those patients the, the probability, probability of we have a later on positive cultures, we, uh, we collect cultures on the day that we measure the PSP and the probability of having a positive cultures or a, another evidence of infection is very high at, as already show you uh, uh, before. Um, of course, uh, is, this is uh, patients who come from the emergency department, uh, sometimes with the uh, uh, community-acquired infection, but uh, we also have problems with patients who are already in the ICU, and these patients uh, receive all kinds of uh, inflammatory insults, uh, namely uh, intravenous uh, central, uh, central lines, uh, intubation, ventilation, uh, they are uh, uh, patients that... Uh, um, have all kinds of problems uh, according to organ failures that they have, and so the the inflammatory biomarkers are always increased. So the, our thresholds are a little bit higher, but uh, sometimes we have these kinds of patients have small increases in CRP, have fever, worsening oxygenation, and the question arises: Does this patient has an infection? And uh, it is in this uh, in this point. Uh, the patient should be improving of his infection, but uh, at some times the, uh, the patient just get worse and we need to know, do you need to start a new antibiotic? Do you need to perform cultures? So PSP was used for, uh, for this, uh, for this um, objective and it's also. And in one third of patients, we have a very low level of or low level of PSP, and we uh, were able to not starting antibiotics in the, in the other patients. Uh, we have uh, and we did start, and uh, and uh, this helped us to identify those patients who need or not, did not need an antibiotic and to improve their uh, prognosis. Uh, uh, the professor Que also uh, showed this uh, this study. Uh, this, both PCT and CRP in these patients in the ICU are not that good in, in uh, identifying patients 
who uh, will have an infection, but uh, P uh, PSP indeed are, uh, have the good discriminatory power in these patients and uh, w uh, can uh, help us to identify, uh, the, identify patients with a real an infection. Note that uh, these uh, patients at day zero, that uh, the day of infection diagnosis, have a high level of PSP above the 400 and, uh, and that is uh, a value that's uh, 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 it's uh, uh, higher than the patients coming from the, uh, the community and with not uh, with a low level of inflammatory insults. These patients have a, a higher level of inflammatory insults, so the uh, levels of PSP are higher, but uh, the in, in patients with infection are much higher and that uh, can help us discriminate between patients who need antibiotics, need to perform cultures and those who don't uh, do, uh, do, uh, really don't ne uh, need that. Prognosis uh, are not, uh, at least in my opinion, in patients admitted, already admitted to the ICU are not that important because uh, if you, you have to treat them, uh, patients in the ICU the same way, in the independence of having a good or bad prognosis, but it can help us you in the emergency department. Because if a patient comes to the emergency department and have a high level of, of PSP that could relate with a bad prognosis, those patients, although they have uh, sometimes they don't have really a, a multiple organ failure. They have something like this, a low platelet count, it's an organ failure, but it's not that severe. Uh, no acidosis, uh, a, low, uh, uh, a small increase in creatinine, so they have um, renal failure, but not that severe, and you have to decide whether or not you uh, uh, admit this patient to the ICU. And you can see in this um uh, using PSP, uh, using this uh, biomarker, you can identify patients who really has a high risk of di uh, dying. This is our data, uh, and those who don't have that much risk of, of dying. So, uh, uh, according to the, uh, to our data, you, we can uh, help uh, in these patients admitted uh, to the to the. Um, emergency department uh, to admit those uh, patients early and at least uh, hopefully uh, treat them early and improve their prognosis. Sometimes this, these patients also need some out-of-the-box approaches like beta blockers, uh, cortico uh, corticosteroids and, uh, uh, and they might benefit, those patients might benefit all, uh, and, and, um, although some others may not uh, uh, have uh, this kind of um, benefit, and uh, the, and I'm almost finishing uh, the, this uh, study that uh, Professor Pe also uh, showed uh, the, can show that uh, that uh, PSP can be more discriminative in the in the, in the context of the emergency department to the, identify those patients with better sensitivity, better uh, specificity also uh, in and help. Uh, help the, the clinician to decide what patients are really infected and what patients deserve an antibiotic and the, the patients that uh, uh, might uh, be, need also admission to the ICU. So the, all kinds of benefits that uh, this uh, biomarker can provide us. So I think it's uh, important to understand that uh, uh, sepsis has lots of mimics and uh, we have really need these biomarkers that can discriminate those who are the original from those who are just copies and uh, who not benefit from uh, uh, the, uh, the common approach of just giving an antibiotic. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Pereira, for sharing with us your experience in the intensive care unit and about uh, the uh, use of PSP, pancreatic stone protein, that seems to be a very promising new biomarker for sepsis. Are there any questions for Dr. Pereira from the audience? I might have one question. Yes, please. So in your, in your study on the blood culture with the low level, you had some patient with positive blood culture and low level PSP. Uh, are those blood culture contamination? Because we see that we have positive mm -hmm. blood culture that might be contamination. 
Yeah, Could but uh, we did, uh, no, uh, uh, I think it was one or two patients. They have a, 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 um, infection in the, uh, the intravenous line, and we removed the intravenous line, and we also uh, identified in, uh, in, the in the catheter, in the, the, the tip of the catheter, the same uh, action, but uh, the patient did improve uh, very quickly after removal of the CVC. Uh, both two patients who have these uh, infections, uh, they uh, both improve uh, uh, very quickly and uh, the identifier uh, microorganism, if I'm not uh, wrong, I believe it was a coagulase negative uh, uh, staphylococcus, uh, staphylococci, and uh, uh, we believe that uh, those patients were not at that high risk and uh, that's the reason for these uh, low levels of uh, PSP. But uh, it's an interesting uh, and uh, these patients both uh, recover and both uh, were discharged from the ICU. So it's an interesting question. Thank Did you give uh, vancomycin or you, you, no, you just removed no, the catheter? No, uh, we just removed the, uh, the venous line. Thank you very much, for Dr. Que, because this was a very interesting question and clarified some very specific question about the utility of the biomarker. Uh, is there any other question? Then uh, we have to thank uh, Dr. Pereira and Dr. Que for being with us and we are very happy to have all this information you have provided us. Thanks a lot. Και αγαπητοί Thank you. κυρίες και κύριοι, θα ήθελα και εγώ κάνοντας την τελική αποτίμηση αυτού του session να πω ότι είχαμε πολύ σημαντικές πληροφορίες οι οποίες ήρθαν να επιβεβαιώσουν αυτό που είχαμε δει σε μια πιλωτική μελέτη του Πανεπιστημίου της Κρήτης, ότι έχουμε έναν καινούριο βιοδείκτη, ο οποίος είναι πολύ ταχύς. Αυτό είναι και το μεγάλο του πλεονέκτημα, διότι η επερχόμενη σύψη δεν μπορεί να περιμένει για πολύ μεγάλο χρονικό διάστημα. Εάν δεν λάβουμε εγκαίρως τα μέτρα μας, θα χάσουμε τον ασθενή. Και βεβαίως απασχολεί πάρα πολύ τους μοναδίστες, απασχολεί πάρα πολύ τους λοιμοξιολόγους, αλλά κυρίως τη ριζόμαθα στους εργαστηριακούς, οι οποίοι έχοντας την ικανότητα να μας μετρούν βιοδίκτες, μπορούν να κατευθύνουν τη δική μας τη δουλειά πολύ πιο σωστά. Επομένως, ο καινούριο βιοδίκτης πιστεύω ότι δεν πρέπει να λείψει από κανένα εργαστήριο, διότι χάρη στους εργαστηριακούς και τη σωστή χρησιμοποίηση του δίκτυ από τους εργαστηριακούς και τους κλινικούς θα μπορέσουμε πολύ πιο εύκολα να αντιμετωπίσουμε βαριές καταστάσεις όπως η σύψη, η οποία απειλεί άμεσα τη ζωή των ασθενών. Αν υπάρχει κάποια ερώτηση προς τα μένα, θα ήμουν ευτυχής να την απαντήσω. Αν όχι, σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ όλους και τη μικροβιολογική εταιρεία που μας έδωσε την ευκαιρία να κάνουμε ένα review σε ένα πολύ καινούριο θέμα και πολύ υποσχόμενο. Καλό σας απόγευμα.